Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on this uh, sunny Wednesday. Uh, my name is Tyson Barker, and I am the Deputy Director of the Aspen Institute Germany, and I am delighted to welcome you to this, our penultimate uh, uh, discussion in our Tech and COVID series that we are hosting uh, together with our partners from Google. Um, our topic today is COVID tech and ethics in democratic societies. And really, when you think about it, this is at the bread and butter of what Aspen does. Um, our mantra at Aspen Germany is advancing a free, open, and just society. And when you kind of drill down in all those, those elements, free, open, and just, you know, they actually present a number of, of dilemmas because you have a lot of competing values, you have a lot of ethical questions, and the COVID crisis has really turbocharged a lot of these questions for us. So we are delighted to have this 40-minute high-octane discussion today. We want it to be as interactive as possible. Um, and I'm going to introduce our guest, Christiana Bulpen. Uh, in just a moment, we are delighted to have her. But before I do, I want to go through a couple of quick uh, housekeeping notes. I think many of you are aware. Uh, first of all, we are doing this over Zoom. Uh, I think we're all uh, fluent in Zoom at this point, but we want this conversation to be interactive. So if you have a question or comment, uh, please just raise your digital hand and we will call on you and you'll be able to ask your question yourself or feel free to write your question in the Q&A. If you are dialing in on the phone, you can also hit star nine and we will make sure that your question is responded to. Uh, this is also a uh, on-the-record discussion, um, and for the first time, we are streaming it live over Facebook, but it will also be available afterwards on YouTube. And we would love to have you join us on uh, Twitter, uh, participating with this under the hashtag AspenTech20. Uh, so with that, uh, I am happy to introduce our guest, uh, Christiana Wulpen. Uh, she is really a person at the center of questions around ethics and tech in, in Germany. She's the professor for ethics and the theory of medicine at the University of Cologne, um, and also the executive director of the Cologne Center for Ethics, Rights, Economics, and Social Sciences of Health. Uh, she currently serves as the chairwoman of the a European Group on Ethics in Science and New Technologies. Um, and, in the, and is also on uh, the Nordrhein-Westfalia um, Expert Council on Corona. So she sits at a real cross-section of a lot of these issues. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, the EG, uh, EGE, the uh, uh, European Group on Ethics, is an independent advisory body of the president of the European Commission founded in 19- and her colleagues in this 15-person commission are advising Ursula von der Leyen on some of these very tough questions right now. So, uh, you know, when we talk about ethics and, and corona, we're really talking about so many layers of, of conflict and dilemma. Uh, we have this twin crisis right now in Germany, in Europe, and in the world of a health crisis and an economic crisis. And on top of that, we have a layer of, of questions around economic, national, intergenerational, and most recently, racial justice. Um, and I know that these are a lot of issues that are really hard to deconflict and to reconcile. So I wanna give the, the floor to Christiana to talk about this and, and maybe ask a very broad question at the outset. Uh, you gave an interview about uh, six weeks ago in Die Welt, in a newspaper here in Germany, where you said, I don't want to go back to normal like we knew it before. Uh, what did you mean by that? And, and what should the new normal look like? Oh, okay. So thanks a lot to have me with you. Hi, Tyson. Hi, all. Hi to all whom I don't see, unfortunately, but to listen now. Um, so what do I want to have as a new novel? I think there are some practical things, pragmatical issues. I think a lot of people of us uh, learned that we have to get more digitization so that the technical infrastructure and all the frameworks around it scale up. Um, they did already a wonderful job during the last weeks, um, but I think we learned really, let's take the example of education and schools, that we have to do a lot more because it's not only to have the digital tools and the networks, but also the concepts to do education and until education, let's say so. 
Um, there are other things, practical ones, like preparing for a pandemic or preparing for crisis at all, yeah, to have the protection clothes, to have the masks and so on. Um, and the new normal is, of course, the social relationships and the conferences. We all get accustomed to a lot of video conferences during the day and we learn where this is positive and where it is negative. So we restructure our everyday life in a way. And by being in physical distancing, I absolutely don't like the word social distancing because you can socially approach each other being physically distanced, uh, distance, um, nevertheless, then um, we got to know what is important for us during the day and which we perhaps had as a kind of um, yeah, garbage <laughs> in our everyday life. But there are also fundamental things. Um, we got to know that we have to appreciate those we had not been used to appreciate so much, like nurses, teachers, those who are sitting in the shopping malls and so on, who had some risks for their own lives and health and who did a huge job for the societies. Yeah, so appreciating them and the work they do for us should be a prerequisite for the, or a, um, yeah, an element for the new normal. And what demonstrations and those who come up with um, either crude ideas or with very valid ideas of protecting fundamental rights and stepping up to get them back um, is that we had perhaps, and, and, and the, the crossing with other developments like racism and George Floyd lying on the floor and saying, I can't breathe. And the virus who also brings people to the situation that they say, I can't breathe brings us to see that there is kind of a breathlessness which came not into the world with a virus, but with humans themselves, yeah? Leading a breathless everyday life, not focusing on what is important and what is not important. So I would say this stepping back a little bit and thinking and just having some questions raised more vividly would foster a societal debate and inner growing in a way that I would say society could very much um, yeah, profit from. Yeah? European solidarity was, for example, one thing that the EGE put forward in, the, in our first statement on um, COVID-19. You, you brought up just in that, in that four, I would say, four vectors of inequality um, that I would love to drill down into. And of course, we want to get to questions as well, but let me, let me start with the first one. You talked about uh, technology as an enabler. You talked about schools, uh, telemedicine, teleeducation, uh, medical infrastructure, all great. Uh, but is this, un is this evenly distributed? And how are we making sure that this is being enjoyed by the entirety of our population? Yeah. Absolutely valid question, because I think this crisis showed as well that the socioeconomically dis, um, yeah, disadvantaged are burdened more than others. So we have a broadening and a deepening of social injustice and, and social inequality. And Europe has to step up to and to live up to equalize that and to narrow people and groups of um, people who are disadvantaged and advantaged. So the strong have to be there for the weak and the rich for the poor and so on. So it's not only to thinking um, of member states to, yeah, to, to foster the healthcare system um, for each nation and each member state, but really to see it as the European task to do that yeah? and to be there for each other because we saw that this didn't work very well at the beginning of the crisis. There were some patients taken up by Germany from Italy or France, for example, but that could have been much more. Let's, uh, I'm, I'm going to get into the European aspect of this in a second, but let me, staying on this point about uh, tech as an enabler, what about the intergenerational element of this? Because, you know, you have done a lot to say we cannot uh, disaggregate uh, populations based on age. We cannot say people over this age, you know, need to do this and uh, discriminate based on age. Um, how do we make sure that we're not implicitly discriminating with our with the technology availability for vulnerable populations, including those 
who are older? I think we have to start with a very good analysis, how to distribute this in a way that the most vulnerable profit the most um, and to really have a look and then give them a voice. Yeah? And if they cannot have a known voice, they have to have people who give them a voice. Um, and I think to have this proper interdisciplinary view on the whole society, and not only to the medical elements, but also to the societal and economical, uh, economic issues is one of the major challenges because at the beginning of the crisis, we just focused on the medical and epidemiological issues. And it was very hard to broaden the view that there are economic issues and consequences and that there are social consequences that are not only confined to economic impact. Um, so. I would say, yes, we have to be in contact, we have to have a debate, we have to have analysis, we have to have task forces also, really to, um, yeah, to have a view on who is in need of what. You, uh, you mentioned essential workers, you mentioned nurses, teachers. We have all, especially at the beginning of this crisis, really recognized their contribution to society. And at Aspen, we're doing a big project on automation. Uh, and and the the disruption that technology is bringing to the labor force, a lot of the jobs that you mentioned are going to be essential whether there's automation or not. We will still need teachers. We will still need uh, nurses, uh, but they are some of the let's say uh, they are not paid well <laughs> in our society. Um, do we need? How do we recognize their contribution to society better in their wages in 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 the way we reward them as as a society? Now, I think it is important to really raise their wages and to um, and to recognize this in the social security systems and um, afterwards after they have worked as well. Yeah, so all the social security systems have to be broadened to work in a thing as we have it now. The European Group on Ethics, you mentioned it, um, we did a statement in 2018 um, it's called Future of Work, Future of Societies. And we wanted to implement another notion of work because mothers who do not paid work, but unpaid work, but they raise their children or fathers, I don't mind, um, they are not so as appreciated as others who do paid work, yeah? even in the social security systems. But they're so crucial for our societies when taking care of children or elderly and so on. So to frame work in another way would be one approach. But there's another one, and that's you, you called, you um, talked about automation. Some tasks of those jobs of nurses, teachers, and so on can be automated actually, and will probably be automated. But then we have to guarantee for the education to frame these jobs in a new way so that they concentrate on what humans are central and is essential for. Um, I think this is a task society has to do, to adjust the jobs, the job descriptions, the frameworks around the job, um, to integrate technology where it is helpful and where it can be supportive, but it should not make humans superfluous, of course. Yeah, but I think nobody can say that there is not enough work. There is, there is so many work, yeah, endless. But uh, yeah, I think we have to adjust the systems according to technological support and where humans can really contribute in an essential way. Uh, as I mentioned in your opening statement, I saw uh, four vectors of, of uh, friction, ethical questions that you brought up. You, you, we talked about uh, the technology aspect. We just talked about essential workers. The third is, of course, race. And very much something that we're dealing with on both sides of the Atlantic. As Aspen, Germany, we are a transatlantic organization. We are watching the George Floyd uh, protests and funeral yesterday very closely. Um, obviously, these protests are resonating strongly in Europe. Um, in elite institutions like Aspen, uh, like the European uh, expert group, uh, group on, on ethics, like the European Commission, the ECB, German government, etc., there is a, a limited number of people of color. Um, how do we address the question of representation? Because this is an element of systemic racism. So I think we just have to look at the balance between men and women in jobs and in, in wages and so on. And we see how difficult it is. 
Uh, I think it was Jeremy Bentham who already said that women should be allowed to vote in, um, in elections. Uh, and it took some centuries almost later th um, that this right was granted to women. So I think it is so important that we just foster the awareness that the human being is a human being and that this is not dependent on his efforts, on his uh, features, on his color, on his faith and beliefs, um, on the way he can or she can contribute to societies. Look at the discussion about intersexual people, yeah, the problem to really acknowledge that this is a third kind of sex and um, that it is not only bipolar. So, so to really acknowledge the diversity and to take it serious and just say, well, the other one is a human being, full stop. Yeah. And last, let's just yeah, appreciate it and, and recognize it and, and listen to this human being is one of the central attitudes um, and the most important attitudes we have to foster in these times. And I think this is always talking about it, pointing to the things uh, where it deviates and, and where there are misleading developments. And perhaps we have even to implement some quota in very um, decisive levels of responsibilities so that it gets self-evident that diverse people count. Hmm. Um, definitely something that we should consider as Aspen Germany as well. Um, I have one final question and then we want to open it up to the audience. We would love it if we can take your question by voice. I see we have one, two written questions. I will definitely read them. But if you want to ask a question raising your digital hand, I will give some preference to people who want to ask it by, by voice. Um, my final question is on the, the issue of European solidarity. Um, when we talk about tech and ethics, you know, there was this very famous quote by uh, Lawrence Lessig, code is law. And the European Union has such an important role at creating law, creating space, creating, codifying ethics in, in the system of law governing Europe. But it has really been absent in some of these tech debates around COVID, around the debate on contact tracing apps, around uh, uh, quarantine diaries, all these kind of debates. Why has the European Union been missing in this discussion? Yeah, that's a tricky question. And I'm really missing the European approach in the Corona tracing app um, that could have been possible. But have a look at the fact that Apple and Google now are dictating us the API for the tracing app. Yeah, and that there is no European sovereignty in shaping the technical frameworks to deal with the pandemic. This definitely has to change in the future. Um, well, Europe was very strong in implementing the data protection law, yeah, the GDPR. And I think it, was a, it is a good one, actually, though in different respects, it could be ameliorated and specified and so on. But in principle, it was a very strong sign with very strong messages to the international public and um, enterprises and so on. But they don't do it in the same way for algorithmic systems. Yeah, there is at the moment the discussion about regulation for artificial intelligence, but there are a lot of people coming in and say, well, we don't need regulation for algorithmic systems and um, we only have two classes of risks, almost no risk and very high risk. And we don't have an intermediate regulation in different steps of risks, a risk adapted approach. Um, and I think this is difficult and this is dangerous. Yeah, because regulation can convey trust, there is transparency, there is control. It should not impede development and innovation, of course, but a good framework can speed up innovation yeah, because people rely on the systems and they can trust those who are um, in, yeah, acting in this area. Yes, so I, th I think Europe can be stronger in this regard. And I, yeah, I would support that the discussion would go on, but come, comes to terms in the regulation about our algorithmic systems, not only about artificial intelligence, because that is just right. too narrow. Exactly. There are deterministic systems that, are, that can have risks as well. Yep. Yeah? So it's all about those algorithmic systems. And just look at the language. 
um, they say algorithms decide something. As an ethicist, I say, well, no, they decide nothing. It's always the human being or a collective who decides something. And we use the technology then. Yeah? But if we really convey our capacity to decide something to algorithms, that never will work because algorithms have no values. Yeah? And we decide only and, and always on the grounds of some value priorities. It's so true. And, you know, when you look at the places where algorithms are being uh, implemented to make decisions uh, or allowed by humans to make decisions, including in operating rooms and triage centers right now, there, there are some major ethical questions. We have some um, questions from the audience. I'm going to start to read them out. We're still looking for those, those hands. Hopefully we'll get some, uh, also some uh, verbal questions. But the first one is from uh, Daniel Bult. And he says, uh, Dear Ms. Vopen, uh, I have a brief question. Speaking of tech and ethical trade-offs, will you download the new tracing app, which will be presented next week in Germany, and could you explain your decision? Yeah, so I was a little bit involved in uh, the development of these tracing apps because there has to be a governance system around them, and uh, it's, it's not only about algorithms. Yes, I will download this tracing app because I trust in the data protection regulations around it. Um, I think there will be ameliorations and adjustments afterwards with regard to the perhaps a legal foundation. We still have in Germany a discussion about whether law is uh, necessary or not to implement it. Um, the health ministry, Ministry of Health, um, so the federal one, is not in favor of um, implementing a law. Uh, but I think, well, we will see how the debate will go. Um, but I think that the tracing app can help us to support the, the public health um, authorities in following up the infectious, what, 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 how do you call it, infectious, uh, the infection chains, right? Um, and to contain the spread of the virus. I think, yeah, we can do it. So, so you'll be downloading the app? Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a question from Patrick, and then we have one uh, a hand raised. Uh, Patrick says, uh, simply asking critical questions seems to lead to being stigmatized as a conspiracy theorist or socialist or even anti-vaxxer these days, while the media are giving a very one-sided view of events and not being challenged properly. Uh, this is clearly a big risk for one of our foundations of democracy. How can technologies help us gain access to more raw data and provide platforms for debate so we can use our own heads to make sense and decide accordingly? Mm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think one request during the pandemic and a still lasting request is that we have to have more data open to the public. Yeah, open, not only open government data, also open science data and so on. And, and of course, there's a need for communication and a need for debating these data. We also see it with insights that there are different opinions to the same data. Yeah, what is called a fact is not necessarily a truth. Yeah, so um, making truth out of facts is always a matter of debate and discussion and or contextualization. Um, in, in North Rhine-Westphalia, actually, our expert council on Corona suggested to have a dashboard, not only on medical data, but also on economic and social data. It is already implemented. It is not yet public because it was launched two or three days ago. Um, but uh, I hope that this will be completely public, at least parts of it, so that one can make up one's mind build one's own opinion and discuss it with others. And I think there was a vivid discussion in Germany really to distinguish between different groups being involved in the um, demonstrations. Yeah, there were a lot of people saying, well, be careful. Don't say that everyone who's walking with them um, is a conspiracy theorist or an anti-vaccinist or so. But there were also people who just stood up for their fundamental rights. Yeah. But of course, this was a quite difficult and even dangerous mixture of people because there are always groups who try to instrumentalize those who really stand up for very good reasons for their extremist positions. So, yeah, 
that was a difficult situation and it still is. Yeah, and, and including, along with data, Patrick, I would also say access to uh, the algorithmic source code. And that was obviously a big debate around PetPT, is the ability to probe how decisions are being made, vulnerabilities, security, that kind of thing. Um, we yeah, have a great- With oh, regard to PetPT, I have to say, um, it was completely open. Yeah, it was also, it, it was always said that it would not be open, but you find all the stuff on GitHub um, and it was released day by day. Uh, so there was never the intention to keep it closed. Thank you for that, that, uh, that point. Um, we have a good set of questions here now from uh, several people asking questions and one written. Uh, the first one is from uh, Georgios. Uh, if, Georgios, if you could identify yourself and, and ask your question, you're up. Hello, hello. This is Georgios Kolerakis from the German Council on Foreign Relations. Thanks very much, Tyson, uh, for that, for staging uh, that discussion. And thanks very much also for, your, for the whole brilliant series of, of events that you have uh, uh, launched. Um, I found Ms. Ruppen's uh, parallel uh, between the racist death of, uh, in the US and the corona crisis, uh, very insightful and very disquieting at the same time. And my provocative question from the side of a policy an analyst would be that can it be that the current crisis on the one hand exacerbates some old and persistent evils and or the crisis distracts our focus from some very, very serious uh, mishaps and, and challenges. All right. In, 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 instead of helping us moving towards a better new normal. Thank you. Thank you. And which kind of um, challenges do you think when you ask whether the pandemic distracts us from those challenges? Oh, he's, can we put him back on the line? George, so you can talk, you're, you're up, yeah. Thanks, I meant for example, socioeconomic uh, inequalities and discrepancies, or uh, distracting from, um, let's say a more public interest oriented uh, technology development policy. I mean, I can bring also a long list of examples, but this could be too relevant for the challenge and for all your comments so that I have appreciated every single one of your comments um, and your insights, Ms. Ms. Wuppen. But of course, I'm very worried, not as much as an analyst and as much as a citizen, I have to say right now, that policymakers in such situations tend to, uh, to behave as in the past, the learning potential is, uh, is probably very low to learn out of that crisis in order to mm. do things differently. So this is the background, let's say, my, my hidden agenda behind that question. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, so actually, I think that the pandemic in the whole fosters our awareness of shortcomings and of challenges and of those things that have to be developed. Poli it, it, but it's not only policymakers. I take your point that you say policymakers could perhaps focus on things that are not dynamic enough to bring societies forward. But at least in Germany, I can say that they take into account social inequalities, that all the measures that were now approved with these um, millions and millions of euros um, to bring the forces to those who are in need of them. Although there are some problems, of course, it's not perfect, but at least there's an awareness of social inequalities. But um, there are other countries, other member states where it is different, of course. But climate change and sustainability is really on the table now. Um, so, and sustainability, not only in the economic thing, that would be my reproach to politics that they too much focus on economics, 
um, because economics and the economic system is not a value in itself. It's a value for people. It's a value for societies. It's completely important and essential, but it, it's, not a, it's not a value in itself. Um, but that there is social, ecological and economic sustainability. There has to be more awareness about that. And to come to the beginning, what I want for the new normal is that we think issues through to the end. So if we have a product and we um, produce something in the industry, let's think about where the product is in the end. Because what I, what I find really disgusting is that we then ship all our garbage to Malaysia, for example. Yeah, that's uh, an international arrogance that we have, we, we consume and we now try to foster and, and to, to, yeah, to motivate people and to give them money to bring the economic back again and to flourish. But what comes after that, we produce garbage and we bring it to Malaysia. Yeah. That, that's not just. And um, yeah, I think those things the citizens have to bring up. Yeah, if policymakers do not do that, and if the economic system does not do it itself, then people have to request this and to claim this and to stand up for yeah, fostering justice and solidarity. We have uh, eight minutes and we have two uh, verbal questions and one written question. So we'll take these three and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, Ambassador Schmidt, you are up. You have the floor. Do you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Barker, having organized today with Mrs. Open this fantastic panel. There were a lot of discussions about role and function of scientists vis-a-vis -vis the politicians. And as you are a transatlantic organization, I followed with great interest the daily, what is it, press conference at the White House and certain discussions here. Would you agree with me that the role of scientists and the function was not too bad? And you yourself, I think you got involved in a what is a ferocious debate because that is my point of view. You came out with a personal view. You were a member of a group and you said, yeah, for certain reasons that was um, concerning the lifting of certain lockdown measures. And the, the fear was that certain scientists get instrumentalized for political reasons. Would you be able to describe a little bit how important it is? And I think the scientists played a certain role and from my point of view, a very positive role. The only question is, would you say that the politicians were able enough to explain to the public why and why not, for example, all these lockdown measures? Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I thank you very much indeed, Tyson. Shall I answer immediately or will you? Yeah, please. Okay, so yeah, to make it brief. Um, yes, I think scientists played a good role, mainly. Um, I think it was not interdisciplinary enough. So what I would have to say, or what we suggested was to implement task forces with a broad variety of sciences. Yeah, the virologist, the epidemiologist, the sociologist, psychologist, and so on, and, and legal scholars. Um, because it's not only about the virus, it's always also about other scientific approaches and framings of what is happening. And immediately the containment measures showed that we need psychology and sociology and ethics to weigh up what is at stake there and whether to open up a little bit earlier to protect our children, to protect those people who suffer from other diseases than COVID-19 and so on. And politicians reacted very differently. I think we don't have to talk about the US, okay? But um, if I think at um, our Chancellor Merkel, she explained the epidemiologic, oh, well, epidemiological things very well to the public. And she had a lot of trust that she communicated with scientists and with the public and conveyed the messages they draw from that. And they made always clear that science plays a role in giving advice, but that the decision, of course, has to be a political one and that there are other aspects also come in. It's not only applying scientific um, results. And we have to be aware that there was a lot of uncertainty and that we still have a lot of uncertainties. 
We don't know what antibodies really are for, what immunity can, also can bring us, whether there's resilience or not. Um, so science has to do a lot still. And I am much in favor of a very interdisciplinary approach. We, will, we have two questions left. Let's take them at a, a rack and stack, take them together. Uh, Katie, I'm going to let you ask your question first, and then I will read York's question. So Katie, you're up. And please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Katie Moss from the British Embassy. Um, thank you very much to you both. Thank you very much, Dr. Wooden, for your time. It was a really fascinating uh, discussion. Um, I wanted to sort of go back to the, the discussion around algorithmic bias. Um, and we're all, I think, quite familiar with um, the lengthy and ongoing discussion um, around this, which we have not, I don't think any of us come to any um, conclusions about how we can solve. So sorry for asking this question. But um, I think I think that fundamentally this discussion has actually exposed the flawed nature of human values. I think we as a group here probably share quite a lot of the same values, but I think if anything, the backlash against Black Lives Matter and um, other movements and the extremist movements um, have shown that we cannot rely or trust in human values. And whilst companies and to some extent governments as well are still not representative of the population as a whole, um, how can we ensure that we hold AI and algorithms to a higher standard than we can expect of our citizens themselves. And whose role is it to, to do so? Thank you very much. Great question. I'm gonna read, before you answer, I know you wanna jump in, but it's a great question, it's a fun one. Um, I'm gonna read York's question very briefly and that'll be our final and then you can take them both and give your closing remarks as well. Uh, this is from York uh, Hesselbart. He says, uh, dear Ms. Wuppen, uh, you mentioned universal ethical standards for AI implementation. Do you think there is a common ground on how to use AI between, for example, uh, China, the US, and Europe? Or would you rather focus on European solutions that hold up regional interpretations of data security, AI use, and human rights? Okay, so I have another hour. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so how can algorithms represent all citizens and uh, avoid biases and so on? I think that those are technical things we have to implement and of course legal frameworks on those grounds, um, those technical implements are controlled and it is transparent and so on. So the German Data Ethics Commission actually, and there's an English version in the internet you can find there, um, has a report on a framework for algorithmic regulation, a risk adapted regulation. And there you can find a lot of starting points that you can take into account to have a governance system that will not impede technical development but foster um, but foster innovation but take into account the um, justice solidarity avoiding bias and so on so there are technical possibilities and there are those um, yeah and, and control and transparency and so on where where this is possible i think we have to do more about that but i think actually it's possible um, and for ai implementation um, i think the us and the chinese approach is nothing we should copy on the contrary, the GDPR was exported already to some states in the East and in the US, not to China and whole US, but California and India and so on. There are examples where the GDPR is a success model. And we should step up for um, yeah, implementing AI according to our fundamental rights and freedoms, which are enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, for the European Commission and the European Council is very active as well. I think if we do this and have kind of an analogous um, directive for algorithmic systems, also analogous to the GDPR, that could be a milestone for bringing Europe forward. That might be a great uh, note to end on. And, and actually, with the look forward in the political calendar and probably a calendar that you'll be dealing with in the German EU presidency, they're going to take up clearly a lot of these issues. There was an AI white paper published in February, um, a data strategy, digital strategy from the European Commission. Um, and I know that the idea, the aspiration to have a kind of uh, global uh, system of values similar to what 
Europe was able to do on, on data protection is definitely something to aspire to. Um, thank you so much, Christiana. This was a great conversation, very high octane, and we look forward to welcoming our guests back for the final in our set series, which will be dealing with um, the COVID crisis, tech, and geopolitics next week. You'll be getting the invitation soon, but until then, uh, see you soon and, and stay safe and stay healthy. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.